Okay, it's uh, 11.30, and it's time for a session on current topics in economic policy. And according to the course descriptions, it says, a critique of feminist economics, equal pay laws, racial and sexual discrimination, and the glass ceiling. And that's pretty much what I'll be doing. Uh, my talk will be divided mainly into two. The major part will be on the wage gap between males and females. Women earn less than men. And this is deemed by our analysts as uh, indicative that the capitalist system is sexist. There are a bunch of discriminatory pigs. And uh, we need the government to solve this market crisis, this market failure. And the second point that I'll be addressing will be the glass ceiling, that women can only rise so high, uh, they can become vice presidents, and very, very, very rarely can they become presidents. And that this, too, is the fault of guess which institution, free enterprise system. And in government, uh, things would be groovy. So let me start with a cartoon, as is my want, because I believe that economics is intrinsically dull and we've got to spiff it up as much as we can. And this is the feminist view of, <laughs> it says, oh, that explains the difference in our salaries, namely the, um, the contents of their diapers. Here's another one that indicates that it's not as good, but it's uh, similar. I feel like a man trapped in a woman's salary. <laughs> now, since I showed two leftist cartoons, I'm going to show a free enterprise cartoon, my favorite free enterprise cartoon. Not that it's relevant, but got to even the balance a little bit. And here it is. I don't know if you can read that. Helping the poor, the big government answer. You see there are people down here at the bottom of the pit. And the way the government is helping the poor is they're dropping barrels of food or pails of food. Whereas the free market answer is, again, they're the same people in the pit, only they're dropping rungs of a ladder on which it's printed freedom. And I think this encapsulates two different ways of helping the poor. The explicit way of helping the poor is you give them pails of food. The implicit way is you give them freedom. And a lot of people think that we're callous because we're not giving them food. And we don't care about the poor, but we do care about the poor. We just care about the poor, and we have a more rational way of helping them. Okay, back to the subject matter. The, there are two hypotheses that attempt to explain why it is that women earn less than men. And the first hypothesis is the discriminatory hypothesis. What happens is you have uh, wages and the quantity of labor, and that's the demand curve without discrimination. It would be for men and women if there were no discrimination, since men and women are equal. Uh, however, most employers are male, and men hate women. doesn't sound like the heteros I know. I mean, <laughs> the guys on the hetero team I know don't hate women, but we'll leave that. Maybe most employers are gay. I, I don't know. <laughs> In any case, what they do is they shift their demand curve to the left for females, and women uh, earn less. And that's, that's the explanation, if you were going to put this in economic ease. It's due to greed. It's due to capitalism. Um, it's due to employer discrimination. Women, is, women are victims of the wage gap. And then you get all sorts of feminist complaints like uh, women with a university degree earn less than men with just a high school education. Working women who graduated from, I'm quoting here from a book I wrote about this, working women who graduated from university earn less than men with less than nine, a grade nine education. Uh, female university graduates earn one third less than male graduates. The litany goes on and on. Uh, here are some data. I haven't worked on this for a while, so my data are a little limited. Uh, this is median weekly earnings full-time from 80 to 96. 
I've got female to male. And you can see that the female to male has risen from 80 to 96, from about point in the mid 60s to 75, where black to white has been very, very constant at around 77%. But both males and both females and blacks earn about 75% as much as whites and males. Okay, so females are and blacks are the discriminated against group and the exploiters on males and whites. And if you're a white male, you're a double bad guy. And this is, you know, uh, difficult. White males have a harder time because of the laws to uh, ameliorate this supposed injustice of getting a lot of uh, schools or whatever, getting into school, getting subsidies, wh whatever the, the goodies that are being given out. Okay. Now, what I have is all sorts of empirical data to support this, but I don't think we need to do that because I think most people will concede that this is the fact. Females do earn less than males and blacks do earn less than whites. I'll mainly be focusing on the female male, but the black white should be in the back in the background. Okay, so that's one hypothesis. No one disagrees as to the facts. The facts are women earn less than men. The two hypotheses to try to explain this is one, it's just sexual discrimination, sexism, the market is riddled with it, the market is unfair. We gotta supplant the market with good old government. <laughs> you could have done a little better. That wasn't five dollars worth of boo, but <laughs> pretty good. Four ninety five. Okay, the second thesis or the second hypothesis or the second attempt to explain it is a thing called the marital asymmetry hypothesis. Marital asymmetry hypothesis means that marriage, not capitalism, marriage increases male incomes and reduces female incomes. And that's why there's the gap, not because of discrimination. Okay, now before uh, there's an uproar here, although this is a very sympathetic audience, I'm used to uh, giving this speech in front of hostile audiences. And now at this point I have the John Stewart mill that you have to hear both sides, you know, the on liberty stuff, but I'll spare you that because I think one of the benefits here is that no matter how outlandish any hypothesis is, people are willing to listen and they'll base their agreement with it on the evidence and the logic of it and they won't just say, well, you know, this is politically incorrect so we're not even going to listen. But when I go to most college campuses and give the, a lecture of this sort, Long before this point, you know, I'm practically being booed off the stage. Okay, so let me just say that I don't think that women are inferior in the market in terms of productivity. I think it's marital asymmetry. There is a case that in the 19th century that men were superior in the market because men have more upper body strength and a lot of the jobs required, you know, swinging an axe or chopping something or pushing that bale and toting that barge and stuff like that. And men are stronger than women. But nowadays in the 20th century and the 21st century, most of these jobs are done with a steam shovel or with a mechanism. And women are equally capable of pushing a button or typing some instructions to a machine. So I would say that men and women are equally productive in the market on average. But there is this asymmetry with regard to, to marriage. And let me illustrate this with regard to the following survey. I'm now going to take a survey of you. And if you're married, answer based on your own marriage. If you're not married, answer on the basis of the marriage with which you're most intimately familiar, presumably the marriage of your parents, or if you adopted your step-parents, or some marriage that you're very, very intimately acquainted with. And what I'm going to ask is, does the husband do more, less, or equal amount of housework as the wife? And by housework, I don't mean just cleaning. I mean shopping, uh, gardening, child rearing, uh, getting up at three in the morning when the baby is crying, um, uh, taking the baby to the dentist, uh, picking up the, the child, uh, being the chauffeur, and also a thing called labor force 
uh, participation. In other words, if the couple is living in Auburn and they're both chemists and they get a job offer in um, LA, and um, uh, which one is the trailing spouse? In other words, if the husband gets the job, he, uh, the wife is the trailing spouse and vice versa, which one will be the trailing spouse? In other words, which one has more attachment to the labor force, the wife or the husband? So all of these sorts of things. Um, so let me... Um, um, errands, a whole bunch of things with regard to housework, child care, house cleaning, shopping, things like that. Okay, so the first option, raise your hands if in your marriage or the marriage that you're now thinking about, the husband does more housework than the wife. One liar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now the second, the second option is uh, equal. Now, equal doesn't mean 50-50. It could be 45 to 55 percent. In other words, roughly equal. It doesn't have to be exactly to the jot and tittle. But, you know, uh, roughly equal. Raise your hands. Got about five more liars. <laughs> now, <laughs> sorry? That's my wife. Yeah, that was a good <laughs> <laughs> we, we know who the liar is here. <laughs> and uh, how many say that the wife does more than the husband? Okay, well, this is 98% uh, of the people who are telling the truth. Uh, <laughs> look, I, you know, I used to run the quarter mile, and my time was uh, about 55 seconds, which isn't really good, but, you know, the world's record is like 43. Nowadays, I'm running again, and I can't even break two minutes. It's really pathetic. But suppose there were two guys who were running the quarter mile, and they each had a personal best of 55 seconds, me and some other guy. And we're at the race, and, and right before the starter's gun goes off, they put a 50-pound sack on my back. Who's going to win the race? Well, obviously, two guys each can do a 55-second and a quarter mile. One's carrying a 50-pound sack on his back, and the other is just running. Well, we know who to put the, where the smart money goes. It's very similar with the husband and the wife. Here you have a husband and you have a wife, and they're equally productive. They both have a PhD in chemistry. And now you put a 50-pound sack on the wife, on her back, in the form of extra housework. You know, there's that joke, the husband and the wife, they work all day, they come home at night, and uh, as they open the door, what does the husband say to the wife? What's for dinner, dear? You have to add the dear, otherwise you're in trouble. Uh, but the point is, why does she know where dinner is coming from? She has the same job at the same chemical laboratory, but the point is that even when they have the same job and the same qualifications and the same everything, She's expected to do the dinner because, uh, house, because of the marital asymmetry hypothesis. And if she's going to have three children spaced three years apart, and from the time that the first one is born until the, the third one is uh, seven years old and is in full time in school, and she's going to do the lion's share of childcare, Forget about just breastfeeding, which obviously only she could do, but just the other things. Women have more of an attachment to babies than men. I hate to be sexist about it, but that's the way it is. Well, how many publications and how many experiments is she going to do compared to her equally able husband when she's doing the lion's share of this and he isn't? Look, there is this doctrine of opportunity costs or alternative costs. Whenever you do anything, you have to forego something else. You people are sitting here from which I deduce that you're foregoing the next best option that was uh, available to you. Now, I don't know what it is, maybe one of the other courses, maybe sleeping, bicycle riding, who knows. But whenever you do any one thing, you must, of necessity, give up something else. This is praxeology. Well, um, it's no accident that none of the 12 or 13 faculty members are concert pianists. Now, some of them can play the piano a little bit, but to be a concert pianist, you have to play eight hours a day. And if you're going to be an economist and, and publish and give speeches, you have to spend some time thinking about and writing about these things too. You can't do both. They're only 24 hours in a day. So what the marital asymmetry hypothesis says is that the reason women are earning less money than men is not because of any intrinsic inferiority. It's because they have other things that they're concerned with, household, and therefore they have less time and energy for market productive work. And that's why they make less money. And there's nothing wrong with that. Whenever you choose something, you have to uh, give up something else. And women make the choice to, to do things in the household. 
and they don't, therefore they can't be as productive in the market. Here's a quote from two sociologists. To their surprise, the so, uh, this is, comes from Newsweek, but they're reporting on sociologists. To their surprise, the sociologists discovered that the social and economic gains won by so many American women during the past decade have had remarkably little impact on the traditional gender roles assumed by the more than 3,600 married couples in their study. Although 30%, although 60% of the wives had jobs, only about 30% of the husbands believed that both spouses should work, and only 39% of the wives thought so. No matter how large their paycheck, the working wives were still almost entirely responsible for the couple's housework. Husbands so hated housework, the researchers found, that the wives who asked them to help out could sometimes sour the marriage. Duh. I mean, this is, this is the way it is. Men hate housework. Uh, with a purple passion. It's, you know, it's one of those biological things. Here's another one, another quote this time from Newsweek again. But experts say that the toughest occupation may still be that of working mom. Many women who are bringing home the bacon are still expected to fry and serve it too. There are relatively few couples where childcare and domestic work are truly shared, says the psychologist, the manager clinic. Even unemployed husbands do know more than 36% of the housework. Now, that's a study in high stress and high shame, says the, the Newsweek, but we don't have to believe that. There's no shame. Men are different than women. Here's another one. Home status for career women, same, even if pay high, study says. Even if they earn a great deal more than their husbands, they still assume most of the responsibilities for child care, too. That's the reality. It's got nothing to do with the market. It's got to do with individual decisions in the household. Now, the feminist movement says that this shouldn't be, that we should do this and that, but that's a different point. The point is why the, the male-female wage gap of some 70, uh, or rather the gap of some 25 or 30 percent, it's got nothing to do with the free enterprise system. It's got to do with culture or, or biology, I'll later argue, uh, individual decision-making on the part of households. Okay. Uh, here is a, a little bit of information about labor force attachment. Here was a study of promotion seeking in some industry and um, uh, were they highly motivated to get a promotion? In other words, this big company had a, um, what do you call it, um, you could request a promotion. And 53% of the males wanted it, only 50 33% of the females, but look at the married and unmarried status. Of the married men, 60% wanted, but only 30% of married women wanted it. So you could see a difference between married and unmarried males and females. The married females were the least ambitious. Because if you get a promotion, if something goes wrong at the plant at 3 in the morning, you've got to get down there because you're the foreman. Whereas a mother with two babies in the house, the last thing she wants to do is to have that kind of responsibility. So it's not the fault of capitalism or anything like that. Here's another indication of the sim similar sort of a thing, occupational primacy. This is for married people only. Would you give up your job if your spouse's job required a move? 4% of the men said yes. 53% of the women said yes. Would the spouse give up his or her job if your job required a move? 92% of the men said yes. 55% of the women said yes. Respondents job more important to family than spouses. 90% of the men said yes. 34% of the women. And uh, the opposite with spouses job more important. So these are just sort of indications as to attachment to the labor force. Well, if women aren't that attached to the labor force, uh, but much more attached to the home, then of course you're going to get these sorts of results. Okay, what I've now done is two things. One, I gave you the facts. The facts are that there is a, a wage gap. And I gave you two hypotheses. One hypothesis was discrimination. The other was marital asymmetry. Now what I'm going to do is to try to pulverize the first and support the second. And I'm going to do it in two ways. One, the logic. And two, I won't call it empirical evidence because I'm an Austrian, but I will call it Illustrations. Okay, so here, well look, as an Austrian, uh, the logic is supreme. We're praxeologists, we're praxeologicians. 
Um, I say that um, free trade is beneficial in the ex ante sense, necessarily so. I don't have to test that. I know it's so, but I can illustrate it. Whereas if I think I'm giving evidence for it, then the, the thing could go wrong. It can go no more wrong than thinking that the Pythagorean theorem isn't right. If the Pythagorean theorem doesn't work, you don't have a triangle. So you can only illustrate the Pythagorean theorem. You can't test it. Well, economic law is like the Pythagorean theorem. And for that, we're called cultists by people who I won't name now. Okay, so here's the logic of it. The logic of it is that men and women, males and females, have equal productivity, PROD productivity, and that the wage rate for a male is $10, and the wage rate for women is $7. I'm assuming a 30% pay gap, even though it's a 25% pay gap uh, for e easier numbers. Okay, so what's profit? Profit is the productivity minus the wage. So how much profit do you make off of a male if you hire a male? Well, you've got to pay him 10 bucks, and he produces 10 bucks for, for you. So the profit you earn off of him in equilibrium is zero, as it should be, because in equilibrium there are no profits. Fine. Now the female, she also produces $10 an hour, does she not? She's equally productive. And yet her wage is only seven because of evil sexism or something like that. So you earn $3 profit off of her. You exploit her for $3 worth. And these imbeciles, the feminist econom economists, expect us to believe that this is an equilibrium situation? Give me a break. It's as if a woman has a little thing on, uh, on a, a sign here. It says, hire me and make an extra $3. Who's going to hire a man under these conditions? Or if you're a dyed-in-the-wool sexist and you hire men under these conditions, people who hire women will be able to underprice you and drive you out of business. So this is not an equilibrium situation. This is a situation crying out for entrepreneurship and not even crying out too loudly because it, you don't need a big brain to understand that $3 an hour profit off of a person is better than zero. So this is just imbecilic to believe. Here is an alternative. This, I think, is more correct. The, uh, uh, an alternative way of looking at Suppose you have a law compelling men and women to be paid the same amount, even though women have a productivity of 7 and men have a productivity of 10. Then what's going to happen is that, again, the male profit will be zero, but this time you're going to be losing $3 every time you hire a woman, and all women will be unemployed. So if you pass an equal pay for equal work or something like that, a progressive leftist legislation, you'll just unemploy women. You'll price them out of the market. So this, that's not good. Another implication of this is, look, profits in all industries tend to be the same except for risk. So if we can avoid risk. The profits in all industries have to be the same. But there are some industries that employ disproportionately more women and other industries that employ disproportionately more men. For example, trucking and lumber mills and heavy industry employs more men, whereas, I don't know, teaching and, and pink collar work, insurance, banking, relatively more women. Well, according to this logic, you ought to be making more profits in those industries that employ disproportionately number of women. But that can't be equilibrium because if there are more profits in these industries, resources go into them and the profits fall and so the profits tend to be equal in equilibrium. So again, the logic of this is just incompatible with the um, theory that it's sexism. Okay, now what I want to do is offer some statistical illustrations of this. One of the statistical, see, look, if my hypothesis, it's not originally with me. Um, by the way, uh, I, I did a lot of the work that I did on this when I was in Canada, and um, me and my co-author uh, had a um, sort of little contest with Walt Williams and Thomas Sowell, who were doing similar things in the U.S. And what we were trying to do is get the highest female male 
our wage ratio we could. That was our little little battle. Okay, so here we go. What we have is female to male earnings in percentage terms. Before I get into this, look, if I'm right that the reason for a reduction in female incomes and an increase in male incomes is because of marital asymmetry, then there ought to be implications for when we bifurcate the sample. See, right now, that, that 70% or 75% is all females compared to all males. But if we take never married women against never married men, and by definition, if you've never been married, then the marital asymmetry hypothesis doesn't apply to you. Well, then we ought to find out what? No gap. And if we take ever married men and women, either married, widowed, divorced, separated, anything touched on marriage, the, the gap ought to be much bigger. You get it? Well, that's the empirical um, situation. So here we go. We take female to male earnings in percentage terms. And for all, it's 37%. That's a gigantic gap. That's 63% gap. And ever married is uh, 67%. Never married is 99.2. Now look, in empirical work, when you get a 99.2, that's unity. I mean, right? In empirical work, you never get... Uh, uh, anything like those diagrams I was putting, 10, 10, 10, and 7. 99.2 is, is unity. Uh, here in Canada in 1971, age 30 plus, total 61%, um, ever married 56. That's our highest number. We got 109.8. I think they had a better number, so they beat us, uh, Williams and Seoul. This means that for never married men and women, females to males, the women are earning 10% more than the men. It's an aberration if you assume equal productivity. But, you know, the numbers vary from 0.9 to 1.1. Right? Because, see, I'm not doing an econometric equation here. I'm not holding constant any, anything else except marital status. If I held constant age or education or things like that, I might get closer to 1% on the assumption that men and women are exactly equal, which I don't know, but I just sort of assume. Okay, here's Canada 71 with a university degree. Now I get 93.4. And here what I do is I, I forget about marital status and I take age as a proxy for marital status. And I say here are people uh, age 16 to 24 and here are 25 and above. And 94.8 again is very close to 1. The idea is that people aged 16 to 24 have never been married, but some of them have, so you, you get a little dirt in the data. But look at the gigantic differences here between this column and that column. See, look, if, if you had the idea that it was uh, sexism, w w wouldn't the, the male... The male sexist, his motto is women should be barefoot pregnant in the kitchen, right? So if he hates any woman, it would be the unmarried ones who have the audacity not to have a husband and not to be barefoot and pregnant. So according to that theory, he should push their wages down. But married women, he should have no problem with because they're properly subservient to their husbands, yak, 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 right? But it's the very opposite. Namely, the never married women, the point is, namely, the never married women are doing much better in the market than the ever married women because of the marital asymmetry hypothesis. Okay. There are many other statistics that I could share with you, but I think I'm going to... Well, here's one that sort of indicates that if you have children... With no children, the wage ratio is higher than with children, as you would expect, because children make it even tougher uh, to be part of the market. What they do in the econometric studies is any uh, unexplained difference they attribute to sexual discrimination? Give me a break. You see what I'm saying? When, when the feminist economists do an econometric study and they find any gap whatsoever... They attribute that to racial discrimination, or rather sexual discrimination, but that's um, unwarranted. 
This is not a temporary thing. And here is a diagram that shows that for the last 50 years, things have been about the same. I go from 41 to 81 every 10 years. And you, uh, you look at the wage ratios, and it's in the 80s and 90 percent for the never marries. Whereas the total in the ever marries, total has to be um, in between the two samples. And it's much closer to the ever married because more people have been ever married than have been never married. You get that? So uh, this is pretty flat. Namely, it's not that in the bad old 40s or 50s, you know, we had sexism running rampant. But nowadays, we're more um, politically correct. This is biological, as I'll get to in my next uh, remarks. OK, that's it for the male-female wage rate. Now we talk a little bit about the glass ceiling. And this is the real radical stuff. So I'm glad you're all sitting down for this. <laughs> Um, here is a newspaper clipping. I don't know if you can see it very well. What it is is that five actresses fave the, face the big 40. This was uh, uh, in, 19, in 2005, so they're all three years older. And what you have is Nicole Kidman, Naomi, somebody, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Halle Berry, Naomi Watts. These are beautiful actresses, and they're... Now 40, or well, one is 37, 35, 38. And uh, according to this newspaper, USA Today, they know, uh, <laughs> these women are now finding it hard to get jobs as uh, sex goddesses or whatever, female leads or ingenues or people like that. And instead, these jobs are going to 22-year-old actresses or 25-year-old actresses. And this is unfair, and this is sexism. Suppose there were two tribes of human beings living a million years ago. They each had the same brain capacity. They each had opposable thumbs. And in one of them, the, the ideal female person from a male point of view was age 55. And the man would see a 55-year-old woman and go, whoa, let me at her. I'm going to grab her. Whereas they see a 23-year-old girl and say, yeah, yeah, unripe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Go away. Don't bother me, little girl. Whereas a 60-year-old woman, whoa, hot, hot diggity dog. <laughs> what would you predict for their ability to survive as a species? <laughs> <laughs> Not good. <laughs> Because I hate to acquaint you with the birds and the bees stuff, but, but women of age 55 and 60, uh, they look good to me. I'm an old coot. Uh, anyone under 70 is a young girl. But, <laughs> but the point is they can't get pregnant. And if the men are ignoring women who can get pregnant in this tribe and, and are focusing on women who can't get pregnant, there's not going to be a next generation. Right? So this is sociobiological. This other tribe was just as good as us in terms of everything else, in terms of brain capacity, speed, strength, opposable thumb, ability to you know pick cotton or pick I don't know whatever it is you pick there in those days, get out of the trees, live in the caves. But they had this one little aberration. The reason 50-year-old actresses or 40-year-old actresses have trouble getting these parts, they can get the part as the mother in the movie, but not as the, as the, you know, girl who's going to meet boy and girl loses boy and then girl gets boy, you know, the usual motif. Because men aren't that interested. Men want to see a young girl uh, because they identify God knows what. I'm not a psychologist. But it's got nothing to do with sexism or markets or capitalism or greed. It's got to do with biology. We are descended from that tribe that looked at 22-year-old girls and said, whoop de do." Not 62-year-old women, right? That's why this occurs. And yet, they would never think to think of a thing like that. Take another example of sociobiology. We, when we see a little baby smile, we go really gaga. And when we see a little baby cry, um, you know, we, we're motivated to do something about it. Suppose there was a tribe that didn't care about little babies crying or smiling. What would the prognostication be for them surviving into the next generation? Not bloody good. 
Another one, um, the, the so-called Amazons. Suppose there was this um, strong woman Amazon tribe, and, and when the saber-toothed tiger came a-calling at the cave, it was the women that went up with spears and tried to fight him off, whereas the men stayed at the back of the cave. Not much prognostication for them surviving. Look, Russia and Germany kicked the crap out of each other during World War II. At the end of World War II, there were hardly any men aged 20 to 50 that were alive and whole. And yet the next generation, it's as if we didn't need those guys. Because any woman who wanted to get pregnant was able to. Imagine the war was fought by women. Suppose Germany and, women, uh, and Russia fought and it was the women who fought. And there were hardly any women from age 20 to 40. What would be the fate of Germany and Russia? There'd be no Germany and Russia next generation. There was this uh, experiment where some very, very good-looking man, Tom Cruise, and some very, very good-looking woman, I don't know, um, Hild, uh, Hilton, what's her name? Paris. Ha Paris Hilton. <laughs> uh, uh, not those two, but actress and actors. And they both went to a college campus and they had the same script. And the script said, uh, I have a hotel room over there. How would you like to come spend an hour or two with me and do what comes naturally? And the male asked females and the female asked males. You want to take a guess as to what the success rates were? <laughs> <laughs> the female had a success rate of oh, 98%. There was a geek or you know, a very religious boy who wouldn't go with it. But the, and the guy had pretty good success rate. He might have had 3 or 4% success. <laughs> <laughs> the point is men and women are very different in terms of willingness to share their egg or sperm. Men have got a lot more sperm than women. Women have only got... Uh, 12 eggs per year for maybe 20 years, 300 eggs, very precious. The man curve, you know, it's way up to the left. Whereas men got sperm, you know, all over the place. They're much more willing to share them. They're very decent. <laughs> Whereas you women are just horrible people. <laughs> <laughs> what was that joke I missed? I, I, I don't want to miss any jokes here. This is a joke that can't be shared with the microphone, is that it? Okay, what's going on here with the glass ceiling? What's going on here with the glass ceiling is that the reason we have a glass ceiling... Well, first of all, what is the glass ceiling? What the glass ceiling is, is that Women can only go so high, they can't get to the upper reaches. And, in, and this is true in every realm of our society, whether it's politics or, or music or uh, economics or just about anything. Uh, for example, there have been uh, women presidents or prime ministers, but you can count them on the fingers of one hand, Golda Meir, Indira Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher, um, sort of running... Uh, one or two others. Whereas every other president or prime minister has been a man. That's an indication of what the glass ceiling is. Uh, most uh, of the Fortune 500 corporations, the president is a man. In academia, it's a little different because you know they're much more politically correct than anywhere else. But even there, most of the college presidents are men. And every once in a while, there'll be a woman like at Harvard now when Larry Summers got booted out for talking about this sort of stuff that we're now going to talk about. They substituted a woman for him. In chess, there, I think the, of the top 500 grandmasters before the Polgar sisters, there was one woman in the top 500 and she was ranked 450th or something like that. Then came the Polgar sisters, P-O-L-G-A-R, and these were phenomenal women in chess. Never before in the history of chess has this ever occurred. And the worst of them was ranked 400th, and the middle one was ranked 200th, and the best was ranked 35th, Judith, Judith Polgar. Anyone's into chess? But still, there are only three out of 500. And the best one is only 35th, which is, you know, pretty darn good. They could wipe anyone here off the chessboard with the queen odds. But still, uh, that's an, an example of uh, the glass ceiling. What about math, physics, chemistry? Who's winning the Nobel Prizes? We don't count literature and stuff because that's politically correct and they just give it to women out of political correctness and there's no 
objective criteria. But in terms of uh, economics, Nobel Prizes, I don't think there was any woman that won. Chemistry, I think it was Madame Curie, right? Maybe I think she won one in physics too. But there's just one. Whereas every other Nobel Prize and Fields Medal in, in math has been won by men. Who are the people that have, um, uh, what do you call it, professorships at Harvard and Yale and Princeton in math and physics? Virtually all men. Larry Summers got in a great doo-doo for saying that possibly this is biologically driven. Well, I'm going to say, I guess if I were president of Harvard, I'd be booted out because I'm not going to say it's a possibility. I think this is a, a real explanation in sociobiology, and I'll get to that in a minute with this diagram. Okay, here is the diagram that I think explains all this. And what we have is a frequency distribution where frequency is on the vertical axis, and over here is good and bad. Uh, let me write, uh, this is good, and this is bad. Notice that women, females, are all clumped up in the middle. I'm exaggerating here. The standard deviation or the variance of women is very narrow. They're all clumped in the middle, whereas men are all over the place. Um, the expression that expresses this would be, um, men are God's crapshoot. <laughs> women are God's insurance policy or biology's crapshoot, or biology's um, um, insurance policy. So what's going on? If you were to go to a mental institution and look at the males and females in the mental institution, and being in a mental institution, I'm assuming is bad, this is roughly IQ or ability or something like that, what you'll find in a mental institution is that it's virtually all men and very few women. If you go and look in... Uh, streets, hobos, homeless people. Again, virtually all men, hardly any women. So, uh, the, yes, there were shopping bag ladies, but there are very few shopping bag ladies to compare to male bums. What about jails? Go to a jail. Now, I'm not saying everyone who's in jail is in jail justly. As a libertarian, I think certainly if you're in jail for drugs or something like that, for a victimless crime, you shouldn't be there. But whether it's victimless crimes or victim crimes, Men are 95% of inmates. Now, if you go to graves, cemeteries, obviously there'll be an even number. But if you look at the ages at which they die, and you look for people who died before their time, and let's say their time is 70 years, and if they're dying at 30 or 20, who are they? Are they men or women? Men. Look, I live in New Orleans and I see the newspapers every week and there are 15 people shot on a bad week and, you know, five people on a good week. And are they men or women being shot? Men. So these are indications of bad. On the other hand, if you look at um, politicians, although I, I shouldn't say that, but you, know, you, <laughs> you see where I'm coming from, or, or uh, CEOs over here, or chess grandmasters or people winning the Fields Medal in Math or the uh, Nobel Prizes in um, Physics or Chemistry. It's all men. So the reason for the glass ceiling, see the glass ceiling is like over here. You have to be to the right of that to be above the glass ceiling. And why is it that men are above the glass ceiling and very, very few women sneak out into there like Golda Meir and, and Madame Curie? There are a few, very few, but a few because of biology, because of sociobiology. Look, suppose this were reversed. Suppose men were God's insurance policy and women were God's crapshoot, and women were this curve here, this flattish curve, and men were the, um, this curve that looks like a rocket ship or something. What, suppose there were two societies a million years ago, the same brain capacity, the same physical ability, the same everything, only... Uh, we had the one that I depicted and they had the other one. Why is ours better than theirs? Why did we survive and they failed? Well, look, a farmer keeps one bull and 50 cows. He doesn't keep 50 bulls and one cow. If he did, 49 of the bulls wouldn't be of much use. Men are good cannon fodder. Women are the precious limitation on population. Right? Look, if these were, if this was women, these women would be incapable of having children. 
They'd be in mental institutions or uh, shopping bag ladies or types like that where maybe they'd be capable of getting pregnant. That doesn't take too much. But certainly they wouldn't be capable of taking care of children. Right? Uh, and also, uh, men, these men here, had many more children than these men over here because these guys are too busy getting into the grave or being in a mental institution and thus being incapable of impregnating anyone. So this way, uh, we have more eugenic as opposed to dysgenic. Are you with me on this? So that's why we have a, a glass ceiling. It's biologically determined. It's because of what happened a million years ago. And what's still happening now is shown by this experiment with the, the young actor and the young actress went to the, um, the, the college campus and, and what happens when people go to war. So that's why we have a glass ceiling. Does this mean that I think that women shouldn't try to be great libertarians or great Austro people? No, that's silly. There are very good libertarian women. There's uh, Ellen Paul, there's uh, Wendy McElroy, there's uh, Karen Selleck, there's uh, Alana Mercer. They're all brilliant women libertarians. Uh, and there are even women Austrians. Suda Chinoy, the late Suda Chinoy, uh, was a woman who made contributions to Austrian economics. Yes, there are many fewer, there are many more male libertarians and male Austrians who've made contributions, but there are some. So my message to the females here is, you know, not to go and have babies and, and get married and, and don't do any intellectual things. Do that too, but do some intellectual things. My own daughter is a case in point. You'll have to excuse a dad bragging, but um, she's a bright girl. She won the valedictorian of uh, her high school, and when she went to college, she got all A's. And yeah, I think she got one B, but it was probably the professor's fault. It was too stupid to realize. <laughs> and uh, now she's just getting her PhD at Hopkins in neuroscience. She tells me what she's doing. I haven't got the slightest idea. It goes right over my head. Is Catherine Murator here? No, she's uh, another young girl who um, got her PhD in chemistry at Berkeley and did her um, postdoc at um, Hopkins. She's now overlapping with my daughter. She's uh, one of our uh, members of our uh, student body here. Brilliant, two brilliant girls. Um, yes, if they have babies, uh, they'll do less than they would have done had they not had babies because of the laws of alternative costs or opportunity costs. But they can make great contributions. See, I'm not saying you can have it all. You can't have it all because the more of this you have, the less of that you have to have. But you can have a pretty good life having children and a husband and making contributions to important things. But you have to realize you'll make fewer contributions. Look, if you take up tennis, if you become a tennis pro, you're going to make fewer contributions to libertarianism and Austrianism. If you become a, a concert violinist and you have to play the violin every day for six hours, you'll make fewer contributions. So it should be no news that if you have a husband and, and babies, you'll make fewer contributions than you otherwise would have made had you not. It's your choice. But don't be blaming the capitalist system for the uh, wage gap or for the, the glass ceiling. Questions? Discussion? Yeah. Young guy there? Um, is it also, you're focusing mainly on when men and women are already married, but isn't it, isn't it also possible or likely that women in their 20s and you know, early to mid-30s uh, may not be promoted as readily because the employer sees uh, a potential of her having children. Similarly, if you have a guy who's, say, in, in the reserves for the military and there's a chance he might be shipped off for five years, you don't want to promote someone to a high position of responsibility just to have them leave. So they see a future time where there's a possibility one may need to leave for eternity. Uh, this question, I'm supposed to repeat the question for the um, uh, tapes that we're making. Uh, the question says, and again, I have to put in my own words, that what I say may be well and true, but it doesn't really tell the whole story because uh, uh, employers will see a woman and they'll say, aha, potential baby maker, so I'm not going to put as much investment into her as I would. In a, it's Look, it's my own words. I have to put it in my own words, but I hope I'm being accurate to what you're saying. And to be non-sexist, you're saying the same for young men who might have military service. Yes, there, there might be some of that. I don't think it accounts for too much because 
even women who are not yet married but intend to get married act differently? Instead of going into physics or math, even when they're capable of it, they'll go in they'll go into something else because you see the problem with physics and math is and, and economics or other fields like that, engineering, uh, geology. If you take 15 years out to raise three kids, or you take 15 years out part time and you come back, you'll have missed a lot. Whereas if you go into literature or library and thing or you know uh, MSW social work, you don't miss as much. So even though you don't yet have the babies and the husband, you're you're going to act more like a future married woman because you expect to be and want to be. Whereas if you know you're not going to be, then you, you know, do the uh, pure intellectual route or the productive route or you play chess all day or whatever it is. So what you're saying is true, what I'm saying is true. When you get into thymology as opposed to praxeology, when you get into empirical, you're just doing rough estimates. It's not as clean as praxeology. So I admit that I'm not telling the whole story. There, there are these phenomenon too. But if they do too much of it, they'll lose money if they don't accurately assess productivity. Yeah? Uh, in kind of the free market for ideas, I mean, the fact that the feminist movement is so popular and it, it uh, motivates a lot of people, so long, the point that it doesn't slander capitalism, isn't it a movement that should be encouraged just because it's demanded by consumers and by people? The uh, question says, um, maybe we shouldn't be so critical of feminism as long as they don't slam capitalism. There's nothing wrong with them. And I agree. There is a group called the Association of Libertarian Feminists. And these gals are free enterprise types and, you know, perfectly reasonable and would accept roughly what I said, maybe with, you know, some minor uh, uh, difficulties. But then again, nobody ever agrees perfectly with anyone. But if you take but the, the Association of Libertarian Feminists is, you know, one-tenth of one percent of all feminists. Most feminists are just Marxists. You know, Betty Friedan and, and those people and uh, Nickled and Dimed and, and all those books, they're just horrible Marxist crap. And that's what stands for, for feminism, mostly. So, yes, to, to be accurate, we're not against feminism, period. We're just against coercive feminism or Marxist feminism, which is the same thing. We favor libertarian feminism. In the back? Um, when you, let's say we're Marxist, but not as a internet feminist, could you still buy your argument and say there's still, there's still a role for Marxism just to override the, let's say I buy it, I'm a man, I, make your career better, I can have a career, I can get a woman pregnant and marry her, and I can just go back to work, you know, eight hours later, which he has to take nine months plus out. A Marxist could still say, fine, we agree it's sociobiological, but then the law should be set up to, to, you know, it's almost not fair, if I'm stronger than you, I can fish 150 fish 10, that you need to make a law that now gives from me to you. I'm just saying, if you can still buy your arguments and, and still be a law, they still make for the Marxist argument. No? Well, what this question is saying, or uh, making the objection, that you could be a Marxist bad feminist and still buy this argument and uh, just say that the law should be changed to help women in some other ways. Agree well, that look, look, what happened to Larry Summers? Larry Summers just said one of the possible hypotheses to explain why at Harvard more men in physics and math and chemistry than women, he said it's culture, it, it could be uh, early childhood education where the expectations are, are placed higher on boys or whatever. And he said a whole bunch of possible things. And he said, and by the way, one more hypothesis might be biology. And for this, the feminists went berserk. There was some woman at MIT who said she got sick to her stomach. <laughs> well, you know, the obvious retort to that is, look, lady, if you get sick to your stomach out of hearing ideas, maybe you shouldn't be in academia. <laughs> because academia is supposed to be the place where you can deal with ideas. So I think you've got a platonic feminist in mind when you, you know, a, a, an imaginary one. The feminists that I know of are, are livid at the possibility that, that you know, the woman makes one penny less than the man, and their explanation for this is that it's um, uh, capitalism and greed and stuff, and we got to get the government involved. But you see, even when you say you agree with this, but the government should get involved, why should the government get involved? There's no unfairness here. There's no market failure. It all comes from biology or the voluntary choices of men and women. Yes? Uh, I couldn't agree more with every single point you made. 
So I thank you for this lecture because uh, you don't easily hear these things, even though they seem so obvious. To me. However, there's one um, aspect that I would like you to comment on. I, I think you put uh, a big emphasis on marital asymmetry, um, which makes it look like the whole marriage institution is kind of oppressive to women, or, or they even use it as a to, to just justify I don't know some attacks on marriage or something. While I see it as a personal choice, of it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of uh, what you and your husband or you and your wife uh, decide to do with your lives and decide to divide your work. Uh, I'm saying this because uh, where I come from in Spain, now we have uh, government campaigns, um, advertising, say advertisements saying uh, you should uh, share the the work at home with your with your wife. You should do more at home. <laughs> So it's, now the government is trying to tell us what to do in our homes and how to deal with our marriage. Mm -hmm. So um, to me, the, the emphasis would be on personal choices. If you do more work at home, it's because you want to. Your husband is not pointing a gun at you to do so. And if you don't like it, you just don't get married or divorce. Yeah. Uh, this uh, person says that I gave a wonderful speech. Let me repeat that again. <laughs> <laughs> And he says he agrees with me, a very wise man. And he uh, talks about the case in Spain where they're now having a government policy to get men to do more of the share of housework. Well, they might as well get men to play tennis more or women to stop playing the violin or, or something like that. In another lecture of mine, I was saying that the, the way they're going is they're going to make you wear a helmet when you go to bed because you could fall out of bed. I mean, uh, talk about totalitarian. This is very totalitarian, and in a bad sense. There is a good sense of totalitarian. I used to play the viola, and uh, every time I would make a mistake, which was often, the um, the conductor would tap his, um, uh, what do you call it, on the podium and say, block, shape up, and he'd go on. And, and you know what he would do with the wind players? You have to breathe when it says you can breathe in the, in the notes. And if you breathe at the wrong time, you, you know, you breathed at the wrong time. Now, you can't get more intrusive than that. <laughs> Even slavery, they never told you when to breathe. But in an orchestra, if you're playing the tuba and you breathe at the wrong time, you breathe in when you should be breathing out, you know, stop it and, you know, shape up. So that's totalitarian, but it's voluntary totalitarianism, if I can use such an expression, because you don't have to be in the orchestra. They don't come along and grab you and say you're in the orchestra and slap you around if you don't want to be. <laughs> but this thing in Spain is is very obtrusive in a very bad sense. Who the hell are they to tell you that you should make a different arrangement with your wife as to how much housework? It's just highly problematic. Yes? The, uh, the black nationalists believe that there is um, an institutional racism and because of institutional racism, um, the blacks should separate themselves from white society and start their own corporations or their own governments and things like that. What's the hypothesis uh, regarding um, their, uh, uh, I guess, uh, lower productivity? Or Well, I favor secession on the part of anyone for any reason. And I was much more of a fan of Malcolm X than I was of Martin Luther King. And Malcolm X was much more likely to say, let's separate from Whitey during his racist period. And I would say, you know, lots of luck. Uh, we wish you the best. We'll trade with you. You can have your separate country. And it could be composed of, I don't know, Harlem, bed -Stuy, and parts of Philadelphia. That would be fine with me. I think people have a right to secede for whatever reason. I don't believe that there's any systemic racism any more than I believe there's any systemic um Sexism. And uh, we've discussed uh, at great length why females have lower productivity. The question, why do blacks have lower productivity? It's a subject that deserves its own hour, but I can only give a minute to it. And there are two hypotheses. And as an economist, I'm not really competent to tell which is the correct one. One is the vestige of slavery in Jim Crow. And the other is lower IQ, as uh, Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein would say. And as I say, I'm not competent to distinguish between those two. But those are two explanations that are put forth by people to explain the similar gap between black and white wages. But it's not systemic racism. Um, Walter Williams has done magnificent stuff um, uh, on this back of the bus stuff in, in the South um, where the blacks were confined to the back of the bus. And the question was, well, why didn't somebody else start a new bus line where uh, blacks can ride in the front or in the middle or, or anywhere? And the answer was the government. 
Because in order to get a new bus line, you had to have a franchise, which means you have to get permission from the white politicians, and they're not going to give any such uh, any such um, uh, permission. So that would be my two-minute answer to that. Thanks. Yes, Anne. Um, could you also make the argument that in many parts of the country, um, black people are more likely to attend the public school system, and so the government public school system is less efficient? What a crazy idea. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to acknowledge Anne as one of my students, and this is a magnificent contribution. Yes, that's a very good point. Blacks uh, get the short end of the stick in a lot of ways from government. Uh, Walter Williams' book, uh, one of his books, is a very good book called The State Against Blacks. And he goes over things like this, that they are victimized by public education, they're victimized by public housing. Uh, they're victimized by the minimum wage. They're victimized by uh, tariffs. They're victimized by, um, uh, I'm sorry? Drug laws. Drug laws. Certainly there's a disproportionate number of black people in jail because of the drug laws. There's certainly unions. Uh, this is Walter Williams' book about the state against blacks for which he's excoriated as a, what is it, a cookie? Um, Oreo. Oreo cookie because he's really white. He, even though he looks black, he's really white because he's for free enterprise. I mean, this is just horrible stuff. Time for one last question, comment. Hearing none, thanks for your attention.